Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to IDA's Award Spotlight of the World According to Jeff Goldblum. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Public Programs and Events Manager at IDA. And just want to do a few housekeeping things before we get started with today's conversation. Um, first off, I want to start with um, a land acknowledgement. Um, I believe all of us here today, um, we all come to you from Los Angeles, uh, which is on the occupied land of the Tongva and the Chumash people who have stewarded this land for generations. We'd like to acknowledge the land, uh, the indigenous land that we stand on today. Now for a little housekeeping, um, the chat is closed as you see, but you can submit your questions down below in the Q&A function. Um, and we will be going through those and we'll have some time at the end for a few questions from the audience. Um, we will um, be bringing you up on camera so you can ask it in person. If you choose not to be on camera, uh, that's fine. Just put that in your question and um, Janelle, our lovely moderator, will read the question for you. Um, this conversation is being recorded and will be um, shared on our YouTube page in the coming weeks. Um, you can find out more about our upcoming events at documentary.org, uh, just under the award spotlight. Um, we still have a, a handful of them coming up in a few couple weeks, um, but you're not here to see me, so we're going to get this started. Um, I'm going to welcome up here Janelle Riley, who is going to be our moderator for the evening. Hello, Janelle. Hi. I was not given the option of uh, appearing on camera or not, I guess. <laughs> yes, well, we're glad to have you. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. Uh, so as uh, the lovely woman told you, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm a Variety Deputy Awards and Features Editor, and I want to welcome you to this IDA Spotlight with Nat Geo's The World According to Jeff Goldblum. Uh, joining us today is the host of that show. He also happens to be an actor, musician, producer, and a very popular meme. Um, please join me in welcoming Jeff Goldblum. Unmuting, and I'm trying. Host is asking to start your video. Yes. Okay. Hey, how's that? There he is. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, the gratitude is all on my side, Janelle and everybody. Hey, how are you? Nice to nice to see you. Um, you know, whenever I have someone as, as accomplished as you are, I, I actually like to start by going back to the beginning and asking, what was your first job in the industry? You know, the first time yeah. you felt you could call yourself an actor. Oh, you're so nice. Let me see. Very briefly, I f fell into it miraculously. I wanted the worst way to be an actor. Started, I grew up in Pittsburgh, started to study in camp there, got the bug and, uh, you know, I was studying at Carnegie Mellon University. Then the six week summer sessions that they have for high school students, really became obsessed with it. Got to the neighborhood playhouse where Sandy Meisner was still teaching. And in between the first and second years, of that two-year program, I fluked my way into the production of Two Gentlemen of Verona, which is the, which is the musical version that Galt McDermott, uh, who did hair, did the music for, was still writing it during the rehearsals, and, uh, and John Guare adapted uh, from the Shakespeare. And I, I just kind of, it's a little too boring a story now, but I got myself into the chorus of that and uh, sang and danced at the Delacorte Theater that summer, um, I was awakening in many ways. I was just, you know, 18 years old, in fact. And, uh, and that was it. And then when I went back to the Neighborhood Playhouse, they, they, it went to Broadway, because it was the biggest hit that the public theater had ever had. And then it went to Broadway at the St. James Theater. Uh, they asked me to go, and I did. I, I, just, I, I, I quit the uh, Playhouse uh, uh, with some um, you know, uh, it was di di a difficult decision, but I did. Went to Broadway for a year, understudied one of the bigger parts, and that was my first uh, job. And then after that, I went and finished up the second year work with William Esper, great acting teacher, and then thought, well, I better try to get a job at this. And the first thing I auditioned for was um, El Grande de Coca-Cola. Uh, I got that on stage off Broadway, and then Robert Altman saw me in that, put me in California Split, Nashville, first things I went up for. And then the first audition for a movie I went up for was besides just being seen in the play by him was Death Wish in 1973 and I got it. I was one of the guys who kills Charles Brunson's 
wife and does bad things to his daughter. And um, yeah, that's that that was the beginning. And I kind of have stayed working ever since. Thank my lucky stars. That's amazing. You went straight to Broadway. I was expecting you to say, you know, you did a Charmin commercial or something. And then years <laughs> later, got your big break. Well, I've gotten big my breaks now in commercials. I'm currently doing that Apartments.com commercial. So I've, I'm working my way down the rungs of uh, the ladder of show business. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you do have your own show, um, so that's that's not too shabby. And it, it is such a fun, joyous exploration of things. I'm sort of curious, did, did you come up with the idea for the show, or was it something that was brought to you? Here's what happened. First of all, it, it, does, it sounds like it's my own show, but it's, it's um, uh, the title developed later in the process. That wasn't uh, my idea, but, you know, it, 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 we... We, 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 we got that idea that Jeff, world according to Jeff Goldblum. So here's, here's what happened. Um, Nat Geo, the great and lovely and generous and kind um, and gracious and smart, uh, uh, brilliant documentarians at Nat Geo were, uh, did, I'm sure you know this show, Explorer. And they were tinkering with the format a few years ago, a couple of years ago. And, um, and they gave a couple of us, I don't know how it came about, a chance to do a few, they asked me if I wanted to do three hosting gigs on that. And I, I did. And it was really fun and I loved them. And, um, and they, they, they allowed me to recommend who I wanted to interview during the interview section. And I have a friend, Norm Eisen, who people may know as the former ambassador of the Czech Republic. And he was uh, the uh, ethics czar for the Obama administration. And Wes Anderson said that he was my um, model for uh, the character that he wrote for me in uh, Grand Budapest Hotel. And so I stayed at his residence and met him. He showed me while he was still the ambassador uh, uh, all of uh, Prague in a couple of days. Uh, anyway, he was on the show. They, I, they asked me if I, who I wanted on the show. I interviewed him on the show, Sam Rockwell, an old friend who studied with, with uh, Bill Esper, also was on the show. Anyway, I had a great time and afterwards sometime afterwards they said hey you know that went so well and uh maybe we should talk about you hosting a, a whole you know series uh in one way or another and and that was it and then we started to kind of organically as they say talk about it about how we might do it and i had a few immediately strong notions and excitements and enthusiasms about how i could lend myself most uniquely and best to this thing and i said you know i loved explore but if I could get out and about, I was in a kind of a studio during that show, if I could get out and about and have real spontaneous improvised so-called scenes with people, uh, um, I, you know, it was Sandy Meisner's credo that you're interesting to the extent that you're interested, and I am interested, and he said also use what exists. Uh, Im an improvisation was the cornerstone of his technique, in fact, and so I was very excited about that kind of thing, and then I wanted it to be uh, I had notions about how it could be authentic and not cooked up in any way, and that I would not pretend to know anything that I didn't, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on and tell you more, but that, that's kind of how it came about. And do, are you the person who comes up with the topics, or is it kind of a group decision? It was a group decision. They were very generous and collaborative. Uh, they had, uh, had ideas. They, they, um, as we started to talk about it, we came up with kind of a theme that became identified as things, shows about things that people love and that are familiar, uh, but that could yield larger ideas and uh, unexpected um, scientific, cultural um, uh, uh, aspects of themselves. Uh, and, and we started to talk about that and as they, uh, we, and we fooled around with a list and I was more interested in some and they were interested in that, and uh, that became part of the process. And then I said, hey, you know, to the extent that this show is a little about, might become a little about me and just my freewheeling mm, revela revelation, revelations and sharing of myself, maybe the subjects could have a bit of a Jungian kind of trigger, whereby my dream life and inner autobiography of some kind it occurred to me, could start to come uh, to the, uh, into play. 
And, and sure enough, there were aspects of that that, uh, that finally did. You know, but as we did it, I got more and more inflamed with what we were doing. I, it was as exciting a thing as I, I'd ever done. They were brilliant. It was a small team of brilliant documentarians. I loved it. I loved their graphic department. And, and uh, we had ideas about that. But as, as I did it, uh, you know, I, 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 I really had an appetite for it to become lot more substantial in scope and so, so, so started to talk to my friend Kurt Anderson who wrote Fantasyland. I blazed through all these books that uh, Yuval Harari wrote that I don't think I would have done otherwise and at the same time of course I mean kind of a growth spurt because I got a couple of kids uh, speaking of curiosity and a fresh look at all the things around us you know you should see my five-year-old and three-year-old eat raspberries, you know, as if, well, they've never seen them before. And they, 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 they don't take anything for granted, you know, and they go, what is it? You know, they may not uncover the science, but they uncover an experience that's probably vaster than I could even access myself at this point, you know, taking apart a raspberry, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I model myself and I think I'm inspired by them. Out of curiosity, have your kids been able to watch the show? Well, I'll tell you, we adhere to a kind of approach which um, denies them for a time, and for this moment, most all screen time, so that uh, in one way or another, they're more present and engaged and this and that, and they don't get sucked into this uh, uh, possibly addictive and, and inevitably, you know, <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know la latching. Uh, thing that is the our uh, all of our media, but um, I'm dying to show them things. And in fact, they've seen snippets of things. I I, I like to show them shorts of uh, Chaplin, and Del Laurel and Hardy and Buster Keaton, and they're obsessed with it. And then just go around being Buster Keaton and, and Chaplin. But I do show them a couple of things because they are wholesome. These little uh, nuggets that we've uh, offered, and um, and of course they're in. A couple of them in Barb in the episode. I don't know if anybody's seen barbecues, which was very interesting. But at the beginning, beginning and end, I, I myself am, am doing a little barbecuing. And they're around, uh, 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 you know, doing it. And Charlie, who is a now almost a, you know quite a bit younger, a little bit younger than he is now, was just starting to ride a bike. So we did this episode on bicycles, and. Uh, at the end of this, uh, well, well, no, at the beginning and the end of the, uh, he, they're also included and they're riding bicycles and he's up and just kind of getting going at the end of this thing. And they gave me for that episode, uh, at the, the, the great people at Detroit Bikes, uh, a bicycle of my own. I didn't have a bicycle in my adult life, really. And they gave me one. We started to, on the show, you can see us riding together uh, that really touches me. So many of these episodes made me weep, weepy. When I saw them, I, I just kind of loved them. And that, that was one of them. Uh, so anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So the kids. So those episodes, I started to, you know, show them snippets of. Yes. And they saw them and they got a kick out of them. I haven't shown them ice cream yet. I'll bet they'd like ice cream. And, you know, they're very curious and enthused about all, all sorts of things, I'll tell you. Uh, I believe everyone who's tuning in right now has access to the sneakers episode, which was your first episode. And I think it's such a great way to start because I didn't think I had any interest in sneakers or the history of sneakers. And then I was completely fascinated by the people you talked to. Do you find that that happens a lot? Have there been things that you thought wouldn't be that interesting and, and they caught you off guard? Yes, exactly. Um, some of these I said, oh yeah, I'm a big, uh, that's a big part of my life, whether it was denim or uh, you know, one thing or another, or, you know, make up because, uh, you know, the chairs that I got to sit in, the jobs, it's probably been part of my professional job. But some others, like gaming, you know, video games, and, uh, and let me see, RVs, maybe, you know, different things. Uh, I, I said, geez, I'm going to be a little bit of a fish out of water. Maybe that's a good approach. Maybe this can be, hey, I, I don't have necessarily a big participation currently in this but uh maybe i'll learn a thing or two and 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 certainly those and many and all the other episodes in one way or another because they're very smart about taking left turns and unexpected uh adventures with people who were fascinating uh and just opened my eyes and excited me about all sorts of all sorts of things you know including i'm thinking pools i got a 
you know, I grew up with a swimming pool and, and the kids are learning to swim and I have some interest in that. But we wound up going to uh, the neutral buoyancy lab that NASA has in Houston uh, that simulates um, zero gravity so that the astronauts and astronauts in training can go down there. And I met a couple of women who were at the end of their program and they went down for, ten, for six hours to work on a replica of the International Space Station. It's one of the largest pools anywhere. And I put on some fins and, uh, and snorkel gear and went down with them and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in the course of that, met some other a astronauts and it's, uh, that were absolutely, who told me fascinating things down there at NASA. I was just thrilled about it. Not to mention in that same episode, the uh, women who, who were in their 80s who had formed a team a, um, a, uh, a, a water ballet team, aquatic, you know, a team. And, uh, and I joined them for that. I don't want to give anything away if you happen to see it, but I joined them for that, learn a routine, get in the water, and we do some water ballet. Uh, but I found that enormously, once again, moving in a different way, you know, so. You talked about uh, the emotion of the show, and it actually caught me off guard. Um, <clears throat> Who had the idea to connect a lot of these topics with uh, your childhood in Pittsburgh? Yeah, who had that idea? Well, like I say, mm, I think uh, maybe we all all did, but I, I might have been, you know, started the ball rolling in some ways and said, yeah, uh, you know, maybe I could talk about who knows if this will come up because I do have an association with this or that or or this. And, um, and then they said, hey, well, if you have any, uh, material so I sent them these home movies I have all the home movies that I have now not all that much it was a different time than now but we have those silent ones in Atlantic City you know where we used to take vacations and and uh, all those things and they included a couple of of, uh, of uh, in, in clever editing the uh, the home movies and then I gave them all my photographs all my photos that I have from old albums of me in Pittsburgh when I was a kid. So yeah, I know. And that when that comes up, and usually I'm talking to the camera like I am now and just kind of, you know, nattering on uh, without any plan. And, uh, and they were very good, of course, in their editing, separating the wheat from the chaff, because I mean, there's much chaff. And, uh, you know, with documentary filmmaking, there's not a lot of, you know, painterly lighting and waiting around for hours. You, mostly you're spending the whole day you know, you know, making stuff and generating content, which I kind of love. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why I've just got a, a, a motor that can that wants to has an appetite to flare up at this point. And I just kind of thrill to the idea of sharing myself in one way or another. And so, you know, uh, that's how that all came about. Is anything off limits? Like I would think of a camera crew was following me around. I would be concerned about embarrassing myself or, you know, asking them to cut things out, but you seem to really revel in being a guinea pig sometimes. Yeah, I'm a, yes, yes, I'm, an, um, I'm one of those little laboratory uh, animals of, of some kind. Um, yeah, yes, well, it, you have to develop a, a trust and they're ve very good, you know, and, uh, and yeah, yeah, then finally, I'm part of the, you know, I'm one of the so-called producers of the show and, and finally I'm involved in the, cut and um and i can see things finally so yes you know i like to feel i like that situation so i can feel kind of freewheeling and then go you know hey may, you know maybe that's that's all not for consumption although you know i have a good i have a good thermostat on me that even when speaking i kind of know what's appropriate a little bit i kind of balance i do a, i like to balance the the wire uh, of, you know, being, you know, vigilant and, uh, and appropriate and creatively adventurous. What's been some of your favorite topics? I always like the ones that are anyway food related, ice cream, barbecue, those ones are so much fun. Oh, you're, you're telling me, well, I'm a food person. I just had dinner before this and I'm very easy to please and very excitable about all my foods. I'm always grateful for my foods. I still think it's miraculous, kind of like the kids that we're in fact eating. I think I have a greater sense of appreciation maybe of like 
food, and um, and I'm easy to please, but I, I I'm you know, but I I have certain regimes. I don't just eat any old thing. Although I think now I've tried everything. I've always been an adventurous eater, and um, and I'm interested in food and how it provides fuel. And what we're doing, it's a political act, what you eat, of course. It's a psychological, spiritual act. It has everything to do with everything that we are, I, you know, uh, as, as you know. And um, these couple of subjects that we hit this time, ice cream, well, who's not uh, downright, you know, fervent and religious about ice cream? I could... Uh, sing uh, rhapsodically about that, and I'm meeting Ben and Jerry. But like I say, I mean, I love it, but I, I've been very kind of disciplined over my over the last few decades, you know, I want to be camera ready, you know, so I don't just sit around eating ice cream all day. Like my kids said the other day, gee, when you're not here, we might just, and when we finally can do it, maybe we'll just eat ice cream all day. I said, yeah, I know you you want to do that, but here's, here's the idea of uh, impulse control and all, all that stuff. But Ice cream is fantastic. I had things that I'd never had before. So over, I was going to say over the last few decades, um, because of what I was talking about, I haven't had much. I have a bite here and a bite there and have not tasted many, many uh, um, flavors that I would be excited about tasting. So during the episode, I did some of that. But during that episode, too, we went to the, um, and that was one of the episodes that choked me up, you know, when I saw it. We went to the, uh, a big, uh, the USS America, I think it was called, big uh, naval ship. And what I didn't know, one of the things I didn't know was that service people, Navy people, have uh, regularly ice cream socials, which always sounded like a debutante kind of, uh, you know, affair. But they have ice cream socials so that they can, as an antidote to the challenges of loneliness and and, uh, and uh, terror of one kind or another, uh, they have ice cream does the trick. It seems to, uh, and, and, and they all kind of had a, a trip down nostalgia lane of what it did and how it brought back moments of their childhood and the most homey kind of comfort, uh, wonderful things. And it was very sweet on the spot. And then when I saw it, it was sweet too. And then the other thing, a barbecue, wow. Well, barbecue is very interesting to me, uh, but I'll just mention one aspect of that show, which was that, you know, meat. We got into a little bit of the meat question and how that um, is arguably right for us and the planet and the animals. And as an alternative, we visited a place called Aspire in Austin, Texas, uh, and they farm crickets. And I visited that place. It was fascinating. They're very smart and interesting. And then we went to a barbecue, a uh, very special kind of gourmet barbecue chef who cooked up some crickets and I ate those. They were absolutely delicious and they they'd were. be fine. Oh yeah, they'd be fine with me. Yeah, yeah. And they're sustainable and uh, very uh, healthy for us and the whole environment. Is that something you knew you signed up for when you agreed to do this show? Did you ever imagine you'd be eating crickets? No, no. <laughs> uh, although, as I started talking about it, you know, I mean, one of the uh, one of the options, uh, you know, originally was, well, do I want to be in a studio and just kind of bookend some things? And I said, no, I like to participate. Get me out there and do, doing stuff. You know, what did I do? I oh, I know. There was that show called for all our the documentary fans. You know, I've been making lists of all the uh, documentary TV series that I've enjoyed recently and over the years or have or have participated in. I was thinking about Finding Your Roots, which I did this last year. And that was very interesting to me. And another show, I guess I'm a kind of softy, but another show that as I watched it kind of really got me. It was my own story, but it was also the story of uh, a, a couple other Mark Marin and um, and uh, a couple other people. It was uh, it was a kind of beautiful uh, story. But uh, but there was that, and then there was um, uh, oh Top Gear, Top Gear. I think of it because I'm because we're talking about me participating in hair raising, sometimes hair raising or unusual activities. And as you may know, on Top Gear, I hadn't known the show so much before I did it. But you know they have you compete in this racetrack driving. It's crazy. 
which I did. Uh, and I'll tell, I could tell you f funny and, and embarrassing things about that. But anyway, um, it led to, you know, this, this sort of a part of our approach, which was, yeah, get me out there and like some kind of goofy weatherman, you know, get me, get me doing rides. I was at uh, the, the water episode. I went to a raging waters and did one of the, where I'd never been. I'd never been to a water park in my life. Jeez. Never. Oh, and, I uh, so many of these things in the series I'd gone, I, I, I was going to everybody all the time. Geez, when would I have been doing this? Thank you so much. I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have, this is outside my comfort zone. I, I, it's not outside, it's, it's not something I would have been doing necessarily. And anyway, yeah, I, I did some kind of harrowing ride on, on uh, at Raging Waters. I mean, you're learning and trying so many fun new things, and it's 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 really fun actually to see you taking all this new information. Um, I'm wondering at, at this point, are you learning new things about acting? Because you've been acting for a long time, but I always feel that things that you learn in life inform what you do. Yes, good question. Yes, I am. Well, my great teacher, who I referenced before, Sandy Meisner, said, "You can't even call yourself an actor before you do it for 20 years steady." Uh, that's when you might start living a life internally of a creative kind of actor. And, um, and then he said, if you do it right, you'll be learning and improving your whole life long. That's the potential of this. And that's what I'm seriously offering to you at the very beginning. And I took him to heart. And in that vein, I think I'm on the threshold of my better and best acting work. It's, I'm enjoying it more than ever. I'm, t I'm telling you, um, I think I was telling you this before, the, uh, I'm working on this Jurassic World uh, uh, Dominion mo movie that we're gonna start filming uh, in a few weeks, you know, during this period. I, we're the first to kind of go out and try this, but they're, they've, they're doing very well, and I think it's gonna be safe. And uh, creatively exciting, Colin Trevorrow is uh, directing it. And we've been talking on the, like this, because uh, he's already in England. That's where we're gonna film it, at Pinewood Studios, where they do the Bond movies, you know, where I, I shot a little bit of that last one too, that last dinosaur movie. And, um, but I have an interesting part in this. I play my the Ian Malcolm character, but I get to say things that are actually relevant to many of the issues, uh, uh, that, as you can imagine, that uh, face us in uh, our world today. Uh, of science and the species and the environment and uh, and how and coexistence with uh, other species, et cetera, et cetera. And my character has always been uh, wise and uh, and smart in in some ways. So I'm kind of tinkering with, I'm learning and tinkering with, and talking to Colin, who's very generous, about things I can do with it. So yeah, I think I'm getting better, and certainly it during this period of kind of growth for me anyway, and supreme aliveness, I feel. That's always a good basis for uh, better, better living and better acting and having these kids, you know, my, everything is changing and being enhanced, you know, and that's, that's not so bad for uh, your acting life, you know. You know, I saw this review of the show that referred to you as a lover of bugs. Uh, <laughs> a lover of what? Hugs. Oh, hugs. Oh. Hugs, yes. And Ooh. I was thinking, uh, that's got to be tough for someone like you in quarantine. Um, you know, and I know you guys are picked up for a second season. I'm so excited. Um, I don't know, you know, you probably don't know anything about this point, about when you'll be able to get back out there. But in the meantime, you know, during this very strange lockdown period, how are you sort of staying active and creative? Well, um, thank you for asking. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it is strange. Uh, Nat Geo, I'm thrilled that we're having a second season too, and I hope it all comes to pass in this volatile and unpredictable world. We have a plan and, you know, we have aspirations and, and uh, I hope that we'll, we'll um, uh, do something. I'm sure we will. Um, but during this period, well, I'm certainly lucky. You know, I know a lot of people, my heart goes out to so many people who are suffering mightily and, uh, and for, for whom this is very challenging. Um, some of this has been a, a, a gift. I've gotten to spend more time with my kids and family uh, uh, in a kind of wonderful way. Creatively, um, well, I, I'm a very disciplined person. That has helped me here. My lovely wife, Emily, was an Olympic gymnast, you know, so she's a master of 
self-discipline and, and uh, synergy and cooperation and global cooperation. So she's a great partner to have for all this. And, uh, and there's no um, you know, shortage of uh, entertainment with the kids, kids around. Uh, they're hilarious and uh, maddening and, uh, <laughs> and uh, wonderful. Uh, but every day, so I'm disciplined. So I, so I go to bed. When they go to bed, we watch something at night. Emily and I, after they've gone to bed and sort of can keep them down. Uh, and then we sleep and I wake up at 4.35-ish um, and immediately do a little of my meditation and my acting uh, work, homework, which includes, I'm good in the morning. I'm kind of a morning person. So I start freshly with my Jurassic World stuff right now and new things occur to me. And then I go over, I'm, I'm up here in the room. I'm looking over to the gym. I got a gym uh, over here, a uh, nice modest gym, but I'm able to do everything. And I make sure to do that. Haven't missed a day of that. That keeps me sane and creative. And then I go down immediately uh, to my piano uh, and I have about an hour's workload uh, that I do every day, make sure I do every day, that will be stuff that I do with the band uh, when we get back to, you know, doing some of our stuff from our second Decca album and going back on tour and playing around here. Um, L.A., if you're around Rockwell, but we'll be around there. Um, so I do that. And then by that time, it's time to wake the kids at 7 o'clock and uh, feed them breakfast. I'm getting better at uh, cooking. I cooked some eggs that are very uh, interesting, I think, with some, some truffle salt that, I, that we have now that I'm experimenting with, and cheese, and da 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 And she's made some steel-cut oatmeal. So we have a kind of a finely tuned partnership, like, uh, yeah, like Kramer versus Kramer, like the father at the end of that uh, movie. He knows just how to make the French toast. I'm kind of getting like that. And then we... And then we're off and running with kids stuff and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a good start for the day and, and there's more after that. Are there topics you've already discussed or that you're dying to tackle when you do go back? Um, yes, there, there are, although it's a little wet play now because our world, uh, as you know, is new uh, and uh, changed and changing and it may uh, impact our shows, even our subjects. Um, although I think, um, funnily enough, our theme for the first season, which is things are how much we love the things around us, and many of these things also thematically were things that brought us together: coffee and you know, uh, and barbecues and pools and all of those things. And we went to the for jewelry. We went to the Southern Decadence. Uh, parade in New Orleans and and had all these group things and and for the sneakers thing went to conventions and tattoo conventions and da, da 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 I went back to my hometown Pittsburgh and they have a Jeff Goldblum day where they give out Jeff Goldblum tattoos so uh, like that so um, it's kind of what we did last year has something to do with this changing world and what we as if it was a, a production of our town and we'd already tasted uh, mortality how we are more present in the moment and cherish each other and community and communion and hugs of one kind or another and connections of one kind or another and all the things of this world that we may have taken for granted. But we're, we'll, we'll, we'll develop that and, um, and enlarge upon that and uh, hopefully deepen it. And there are specific subjects, uh, but I, I think I should be mysterious about the particulars <laughs> in the second season. Fair enough. Um, I can't wait, though, because it is so much fun. And it's actually been mm -hmm. great quarantine viewing and sort of like exploring the world from inside my home. <laughs> um, Thank you. We're actually going to take some questions from the audience. Um, our first question is from Karen. Uh, actually, I guess she's going to ask the question. They're going to bring her video up. I was. Let's see, Karen. Come on. Join Karen. us. A moment. Karen. There she is. <laughs> hi, Karen. By the way, Karen. Oh, oh, hi, Karen. Hey, Karen. <laughs> do you know what? Do you know what my middle name is, and do you know what Janelle's middle name is? I don't. They're both the same name. Really? Did you know that? Did you know that, Janelle? I Are have the same kidding? name as you. Yeah. 
My middle name is my name on my birth certificate. My driver's license is Jeffrey Lynn, L-Y-N-N, Goldblum. Get out. Yeah, and it's yours too, I know. Wow. He knows his stuff. <laughs> well, it's not my middle name. <laughs> Karen, what's your middle name? My middle name is Marie. Oh, Marie. Mm -hmm. How do you solve a problem like Marie? <laughs> Yeah, but yes. Marie, yeah, Marie. So nice to see you. Thank you, Karen. What what can I do for you? Thank you. Well, the show is so much fun, and you met so many really interesting people and heard so many fun stories. I was just wondering, who was someone that really stood out to you? So many people, but I'll tell you, off the top of my head, like I said before, but I didn't tell you one of the stories, I went to that NASA um, swimming pool down there, and I met, she just happened to be there that day, a wife of uh, an astronaut who was, who was currently up in the space station. And she said, oh, he's a fan of yours. And da, 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 we got to talking and he called me on my cell phone. The, the connection was crystal clear and we talked. I talked to this guy from who was up in the, in the space station. And then she told me this story. I'll make it brief. It didn't make it in the show. We didn't film it, but she said, oh, you know, I, uh, I, I got to asking and she said, well, you know, this is his first time up there, but not really, because he went up, he was launched in this last year and we've got two teenage boys. We all watched him get launched and there was a problem once they started up shortly into the flight and it kind of exploded, but not before he was able to get into a kind of a safety uh, exit uh, ejection pod um, and make his way back. But it was not immediately evident and it was a hairy time coming back. And she said it was the most traumatic thing I'd ever been through. And the boys, as you can imagine, were watching live and da 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 da. And this time he decided to go up again, give it another try. And that and he's up there now because of the second try, but we didn't let the boys watch and I'm listening to her. And while I was listening, I just found it so moving and unbelievably, uh, you know, I'd, I guess I'd seen that movie too, First Man. You ever see that movie, First Man? Mm -hmm. It's all about the wife and the, and the husband, Ryan Gosling, he's Neil Armstrong and it's so low tech and she's so worried. And I just found it so moving. And likewise, that story, anyway, that's what comes to mind. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we have a question from Alex A, who uh, I, I'm going to read the question, wants to know, oh, how much, how much research do you do prior to each episode, and how do you work with the director to keep it fresh and fun? I'm glad you asked. We had um, uh, uh, three wonderful directors for all these episodes. They kind of traded off. They were just spectacular. Um, here's what we did. Here was my instinct about it. We kind of, it we became our approach. And, um, and we kept fooling around with it. I, 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 I learned something, not, not all that much, uh, enough to be able to have a substantial conversation with them and to excavate from them what they, the researchers already knew were nuggets of, of interest. Uh, but besides that, wanted to be informed on camera really about the whole thing and be a kind of learning, a kind of good student. And so that's what we did. And then I got a, I got a notebook. You see it in some of the episodes. That's kind of little like a detective's notebook with a little tiny pen attached that I thought was picturesque and photogenic and, and would, you know, ask him things and kind of take notes like a kind of reporter or an investigator or a detective. And, and usually the day of the shooting, the director and I would get in the car because there was no, it was very kind of down and dirty. There was no um, trailer or RV. Uh, it's just, you know, I'd get in the car that had, you know, brought me luxuriously to work. But, but unconventionally, I'd be in the back of the car. The director would join me. And they, he'd say, here's what we're going to do today. Here's who, we're, here's who we're meeting. And on that day, I'd usually take notes and start to kind of, from my dream life and just from my associations and little things that were kind of out of left field, and just anything that I was really interested in on that day, sometimes uniquely on that day, given my biorhythms or, or whatever, I'd make some notes. And then sometimes in the interview I'd, or when I'd see them, I'd, that would come out or I'd talk to the camera and 
be talking about those things that I was just kind of interested in. And then I'll tell you, before the show, before the shows, when they were started putting the shows together, I would, they said, hey, we're going to ask you some questions about just your things that might, you know, bring out, you know, all your feelings and associations and past autobiographical things about this subject. And I would, I would record it and send it to them. And that would become kind of a guide and work, work its way into the show. And then they said, you know, some of that stuff is so useful that we're gonna make it part of the voiceover. So I started to do that in a recording studio. So they would use some of that stuff. So even our voiceovers, I wanted, I had a, we all had a feeling to make them unconventional and kind of unique to me. And, and I'd get a, tr a, a guide writing text that was you know that could link us between scenes but then i'd fool around with it and even spontaneously in the studio start to do a bit of a podcast about the thing and and they would get little snippets they, that they thought were relevant and so it became not a kind of standard you know and then the ba 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 and i'd seen so many documentaries where the host would then look at the camera and say you know, probably read some teleprompter maybe a little bit and say, ga 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 ba 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 And here's the thing. And they'd staged some sort of walk and talk maybe. You know, I just wanted to steer clear of some of that stuff. Yeah. Well, it's such a fun and unique and original idea. I, I really enjoyed every episode. And I want to remind everyone watching that all the episodes are available now on Disney Plus and you all have access to the sneakers episode. So please check it out. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, it's gone like that. I can't believe there's not an hour or two more. Thank you so much, Janelle. Thank you to everybody. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both so much. It was such a joy. Uh, we could talk to you all night, but uh, we will let you go. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we have four more of these left. So you can go to documentary.org and click on Award Spotlight and see them. But thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Janelle. This was wonderful. Thank you so much, Cassie. No I'll problem. Have a good night, everyone.